battle. It's now uh, 6.19, 12.00 for the meeting to order. I would like to just uh, tell uh, the visitors who have come in tonight uh, that we are here to carry on a meeting, so we will not be answering uh, or taking any questions. We ask that you sit and listen, please. I'm going to start by introducing myself, and if you could just go around the table, we have a, a new member here tonight, and we have some of us haven't met, and none of us have met before. So, once again, my name is Jocelyn Skerlack, I'm chairing this meeting, and I represent the Western West Shore area. I'm Robert Bassett, and I'm from uh, Fish. Uh,
location. And then there's the, well, I can't remember what, what the lethal population control. Population control. So those are the, the four options that we've been presented with. Um, and I mean, I, unless, I, I don't know of any other options that are out there. I, that's what I took this question to mean. That's right. Are there any other options? And, um, unless the expert panel has come up with other options. You know, I presume they've had some, but I can't. All of the material in here relates to those four options, basically. So, and the administrative option is really, um, it's not an option in its, and of itself, it, it flows from what you decide to do. Um, so I wouldn't call that an option. I'd call it something else. But, um, that's just semantics. I think indirectly, the the uh, expert resource working group assisted in uh, helping us right. populate the binder. Mm -hmm. So you know, indirectly, these are materials that they feel are the best array of options for you to look at. So nobody found another magic option other than what we're trying to do today. Okay, so the second part discuss information gaps and solutions. Anybody like to start? Did first of all did anyone find a gap problem? Um, I guess the issue that concerned me the most was um, we have the, the Ministry of Environment with their their sort of broad total number of deer in the southern mm -hmm. island. Well, it was 45 to 65,000, I think that was the number. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, it has been increasing. It's steady now, but it could increase. But it's that's a very unsatisfactory number to me. And when you look at all of the other studies, Helena, Winnipeg, um, Cranbrook, they all have very specific numbers relating to deer per kilometer. And they all have very clear conclusions that that population has, is the cultural or over the cultural um, carrying capacity. So you have a number and a conclusion. We don't have anything like that here. We have no counts about um, Victoria or, or anywhere. And I, I just don't see how we can come up with any um, useful or meaningful conclusion or recommendation if we don't have that basic fact. And um, the other thing that all these <coughs> other communities had were um, sort of scientific polls done. Uh, we have a, an email um, catchment of people coming in with their comments, and we have quite a lot of those. But we have no um, uh, scientific poll um, done by a professional organization, although I gather it's in the budget for the end of the process. What, sorry, be more specific. What do you mean by scientific poll? I, I mean a, um, something that, you know, one of the um, where you get into political preferences and parties, and something that Gallup would do, or uh, uh, where you get a whole bunch of questions and you indicate. Okay, so it, it's, the population. it's anonymous. It, it's, it's, it's not, you're not, people aren't coming to you, you're going out to them, basically, through telephone, email, mm -hmm. whatever. And so the thinking behind um, the thinking behind reserving that to sort of the end of this process is to permit an informed some informed recommendations by the citizens group prior to. I, I guess what I'm saying is we need that now. That's not 
not something that we should wait for. Can I add to that? Um, in this uh, thesis, she did, um, she sent out a survey to 4,000 residents in what the Greater Winnipeg area. I think she got about 1,500 back. She had a 33% return. And then she followed it up twice. And then she also did a telephone survey as well. And that's how, what she based her thesis on. She got, I think it was a 17-page survey that she sent out. It was a very detailed survey with very detailed questions. And she got a lot of um, really solid answers and a lot of information back. And that was, that was the basis of the thesis. And I think is that was what, more what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, I, I get, I need to be convinced that there's enough information here for us to make an intelligent decision on anything. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, I mean, personally, I don't think there is, but I'm, willing to be convinced. But, you know, we don't we don't have a count in Victoria. Mm -hmm. We don't have a count. We, we know that there's a real problem in Saanich, but we don't have a count. Um, and all of these other uh, communities where they've done something about this, they start with the count. Um, without that count, you cannot then measure what the carrying capacity of the area is. Right, and I think we touched on that at your first meeting, where this strategy might have to you know, back up a little bit from where the other ones began because of that lack of base information, and that is certainly a legitimate recommendation from this group to the board to uh, collect that information. Okay. So in terms of, uh, I guess, I'm just wondering, um, you know, if, if we decide, that if there's a consensus that we need this information before we can really do very much, would it not be better to say now that we need that information? Right. Or, or, I mean, how do we proceed if we don't have that information? And, and I agree, because I think it was you last meeting talked about the need for non-anecdotal information, and I think that's what and I, I have an issue with that as well, as to what are we comparing these these so-called numbers that keep coming up, or letters to newspapers or media reports, and it's, it, it's, I'm not sure what it's all based on and where the information is coming from. A lot of it seems to be pulled out of the air. And I also have um, issues about, and that's why I asked for the population numbers last week, is just to compare human population going up to deer wildlife populations going up. And all I, we hear about is the wildlife populations are going up, the deer population is going up. But in comparison to what? And um, we also need to um, contrast it with human activity and loss of habitat and all those kinds of things. And it's not, it, it's not just that deer have suddenly exploded out of nowhere and They've, they've come out of nowhere for no reason, and, and that seems to be, for me, a big issue is establishing some kind of baseline, and I think that's <coughs> what you're getting at as well. Is there any previous numbers, like 10 years ago, 20 years ago, what the population of the deer were? I think here we can, we can find it. There's a few different numbers floating around based on different methodologies that were done, mm -hmm. so we would have to find a comparable methodology to the count that was but that's a that's across Vancouver Island. That's not specific to the CRD. So, sorry, I'm just needing one question for you. Are you looking for like deer per acre? Well, the the the, or what? the stats that these other places use is deer per square kilometer, oh. and it's used in in the material here. That's that's the the number that they, yeah. they quote. Um, but, you know, it, I, um, in Helena, they, they did that. They used the police to come up with that figure. I mean, they literally went down every single street in the community mm -hmm. three or four times a day to physically count them. Um, Geographically, it was easier to win. Okay. Maybe, I guess. <laughs> Not as many trees. I guess, yeah. 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 Um, Patrick, sorry. I agree that it would be useful to have the information, uh, better population information. But I suspect that um, if we wait for that information, we can all go have a nice, quiet summer and come back in the fall, mm -hmm. which I don't think is our mandate. Mm. So it seems to me. 
me the question is how do we go about incorporating that at least into one of our recommendations, which leads actually to lead to one, maybe two questions, structural questions. One is, is there any capacity for the, the group to make interim recommendations to the board? And you may not know an answer to that, but I think it will be worth looking at. And the second one, Jeff, is whether it's something you could go to the expert working group on and try and get their thoughts or advice or information on, I mean, is it realistic to have the police do it? I, I suspect that if we wanted the police to do it, we could take a year off and come back and only to be told, no, they won't. So I, I agree, but I don't think that we have the luxury of, of waiting for that information. Um, and Robert, on your other point about needing some sort of scientific poll of the community, um, I don't think we do need that. Uh, I don't think it's our job to read public opinion and do what public opinion is saying should be done. If that was the case, the board could have done the survey and acted accordingly. And I think the board chose to do something else. Um, and I just, more philosophically, I guess, or point of principle, I don't think problems like this can be resolved by doing a poll and asking people what they want to do. Uh, yeah, no, I, I agree with that, except, you know, I think that at the end of the day, um, no politician is going to make a decision without that. And I guess that's why it's, it's built into the end of the process rather than now. I'm just saying I think it would be hugely helpful for us. I know that we're not speaking for politicians, but, um, you know, in terms of measuring that cultural carrying capacity, I don't know how else you do it. Well, it's great if I could respond to that. I think that's why we made the information that we have available to you, that you can see the type of um, commentary that's been coming in through the, uh, the Deer Management website and email. And uh, can certainly use that to inform yourselves of the uh, sentiment of those that have stepped forward with concerns. Um, sorry, Bob. Yeah. <coughs> uh, the census information that we're talking about will probably be very difficult to collect, extensive. The deer feed primarily at night. Uh, my experience in doing animal counts has <coughs> would, would not give me a lot of confidence in the numbers we might come up with. But even if we did have reasonable numbers, it's only a snapshot of now that wouldn't indicate any trend information. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Well, I was just going to ask about, I, I read, I don't know if it was Sydney Island or another, one of the studies they did, air, they did aerial counts. Was that, do you know more about that? I did some work on Sydney Island, not necessarily population work, but um, it's quite open. <coughs> Even the forested areas are quite open, mm -hmm. and the deer are not hard to find. They're out there in the middle of the day. There's not a lot for them to eat, so they're active just about <coughs> all the time. Which they are in the city. But <laughs> <laughs> not so much out in the, right. in the fields when they come in at night, mm -hmm. or first thing in the morning. But I mean, I did have uh, one of my little notes in here, <laughs> one of many, was um, to contact each of the municipal, mun municipalities' police departments for their thoughts on the deer situation. Because I've had comments from the Central Sandwich Police many, many times about the amount of deer that they see when they're driving around at nighttime, because they d that's all they do is drive around at nighttime. And I mean, they know that there's deer all over the place in Central Sandwich, so I'm assuming that probably you'd get that same kind of a reaction from some of the other muni municipalities as well, from their police departments. <coughs> so whether it would be on the line to have the, um, the other committee contact the police departments and get some feedback from them? It wouldn't be a count, it wouldn't be a census, but it would be a yeah, there's a lot of gear up there at night. Well, would it be more appropriate for us to have it as, a, as one of our suggestions and our strategies as, as a, a group to use to kind of find some, to come up with some kind of figures? Okay, well,
well, again, looking at Sydney Island, there's, they had a particular strategy that they used based on a certain number of deer. They found it was ineffective over, over quite a few years. And they used those numbers to be able to count that. And how would we be able to make any recommendation on a strategy? I can see how, even with anecdotal information, we can see what the problems are. We can, we can easily say, yes, there's an obvious problem. Lost crop losses, you know, issues with collisions and all of that. But we can't actually come up with a strategy recommendation if we don't have any numbers, it seems to me. I mean, if you're going to say fertility, you know, use of fertility control, is that going to be effective if you've got this many, this many deer, or? Could we have a show, have a show of hands of how many of you feel that this is something that we need to have these kind of figures? Establishing a population. Yes. yes. I think all those in favor? Okay. It, w it would be something you'd find necessary. Sorry, can I just, I'm not sure what it is we're voting on. Or oh, no, it's, it's, not, it's not a vote. <coughs> just to, to get an idea of how many of you feel that if we don't get these kind of figures, we're really kind of swimming without a floater here. Can I just, yeah. I just want to. Oh, sorry. Uh, we. That's right, yeah. We are kind of not taking quite that. Is it? Uh, there is one. I mean, it, it may be that we're pa comparing apples with oranges here. I mean, it may be easy in Elena to come up with these figures or in Cranbrook. Um, and it may, in fact, uh, you know, be very difficult to do that in Victoria and surroundings. Um, so, I mean, if that's the case, then we have to come up with some other strategy in terms of how we make the decisions we're going to make or the recommendations we're going to make. Um, but we, we, we either need the numbers or we need another strategy. Mark. Okay, so that's exactly what I was thinking, Robin. Um, so I think that we take your point that you want us to go back to the expert resource working group and have a, a more fulsome discussion on, you know, numbers and what uh, what uh, what we might be able to do about that now, or what we, you know, how important that is to a strategy. Uh, I think, though, that the committee or the group here should maybe think about other approaches to making recommendations, whether those are issue-based, as you maybe just alluded to, uh, so that if there were um, situations where deer were perceived to be a problem, then you know, step number one might be you know, to do a count, but what are the types of um, options that might be best to address the issues? And certainly from the email input, you got uh, a good indication of what the issues are uh, as voiced by those who chose to bring those concerns forward, right? So there's, and those are summarized in the in terms of reference. And in terms of issues, I think certainly we can work on, on sandage, which is a priority anyway. Um, you know, the economic loss issue. We have that that's being given to us as the priority. Mm -hmm. um, Wend has given us a lot of information about what those losses are. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's one one thing to concentrate on, perhaps, as opposed to the numbers. So, mm -hmm. Thank you, Robin. So, are there any other <coughs> gaps in information that anybody I just wanted yeah. to uh, you know, bring forward in regards to um, within our community, um, there's less developed areas within our community, so you know the populations that are being pushed from the developed areas, you know they come into our community. You know, there's less developed areas in our community, so there's you know a lot more different wildlife coming through um, through our community. You know, so I'd like to, you know, it is. Uh, 
you know, it, it's a wide range of, um, you know, wide range issue. It, it, it touches our community as much as it touches the outside community and outside of uh, the Sartlet community. I can't speak on behalf of the other three communities, but, you know, I, um, you know, make that suggestion to the table because I came across this by, um, you know, just searching for deer hides uh, for a drum making thing in our school. So, you know, they, I came back about the have you read on this CRD deer management? Would you be interested? And I just kind of thought, well, yeah, I think it would be because it's uh, part of our cultural heritage and our food, and you know, a lot of our people still, you know, uh, really utilize the the deer for not only food but ceremonial practices. So there's a lot of different uh, uses for this animal that you know it's kind of being taken as a you know as a pest, but as a uh, you know, it's a food source for, for a lot of our people. And I think it's something that, um, you know, that piece of the peninsula, especially, uh, you know, see, um, Sayot is, you know, they have some farms boring their, their properties. You know, so, you know, Sayot needs to be consulted and talked to as well in regards to what, you know, because if the partnerships are there with those communities, then you have that, you know, the permission from, from them to go onto their, into their community and, you know, carry out this beer, whatever the plans are, you know, whatever the goals are going to be, because if you chase them out of those farm areas, you know, the next, next visit they're going to stop at is our place in, in our area, you know, because it's not developed as much as the urban areas, you know, so they're going to be, you know, it's happening already when you see developments happen in our local peninsula area. You see a little bit more deer come into our backyards, and you know it's. Uh, um, but I think that the consultation with the other communities needs to happen. Um, in regards to you know we do have the Douglas Tree and all, all within Sartlet. Um, the other with Saint communities all have the same same rights, and um, you know I think they need to be consulted as well, as much as uh, you know as. I was quite surprised that this was happening, and then, you know, to come on board with it is uh, another thing, and then um, it was kind of a surprise to our uh, leadership that, you know, that this was happening, and then I just let them know that I'd be sitting on, on, in, on this meeting, so. Um, so I just think that consultation with the local communities in that area, because, you know, the farm lines are bordering those communities as well, and, uh, you know, the problems are, among the money lost, but it's also if you take care of that, then it's you know, it's going to be coming into our community anyway. So it's um, consultation with them that has to happen, I believe. Um, just as to seeing in the recommendations from somebody that emailed in a recommendation, you know, the Douglas Tree is a is an inherent right that still exists, and that hasn't been acknowledged in all of this. And I think that's something that uh, could and. Uh, you know, partnerships with the First Nations communities would move things along in a way of, you know, in a humane way, I think it would be, um, you know, because the animal is not going to get wasted. It's not just, oh, it's come down and making a garden fertilizer. It's, it's going to become a part of somebody's life for a long time because of the ceremonial pieces that the animal gets used for. It's used for making drums and a bunch of other regalia. So it's, uh, so that piece of uh, information about, you know, using the animal just for, you know, feeding, you know, for uh, needy people, as I've seen in there. So, you know, it um, is Phil, I'm just, I'm just going to stop you there. Uh, I don't know how much of a chance you had to read through the binder, but um, there is, there are quite a few points where it does recommend that each municipality or area has to be brought into this, and, and that the uh, recommendations may be different for each of those areas. So there's no one simple fix for this. That's why it's so complex, because the deer are mean different things to different areas. Oh, I understand so that's that, part of our saying that the consultation piece is not, yeah. uh, has not happened with, uh, with our community. So I'm just saying that, that is, you're asking for missing information. That's one missing information piece oh, that I can see with this is that there hasn't been no consultation with our people in regards to the 
your management area, so that's Okay. You're asking for missing information, that's what I'm giving it to you. Good, thank you. Our expert resources working group, we do have a representative from uh, from SACOM at this point, and we're, we're in the process of seeing if, uh, if or we have been in contact with someone from the South as well. Wendy, and I want to mention too that at the last meeting there was uh, information, I did provide information um, about uh, the process of of um, killing the deer on the farm properties and that the deer would be given to the First Nations and I have had a lot of contact with animals in regarding that. So it's not that nothing has been said, it's just maybe along the way you didn't have to hear about it, but there has been contact with people regarding that. We haven't ignored you. Uh, information gaps. You talked briefly last time about the uh, bylaws, and I looked in the package, and the only information we have on CRD deer management bylaws is around uh, feeding and attractant, and I was wanting to know if there are other bylaws other than that, so we could, mm -hmm. we could check into that and see what there might be in terms of wildlife control and things like that. So hunting and stuff like that, is that what yeah. you're doing now? Mm -hmm. information I, I think that might be useful too is if we're looking at like for example uh, First Nations using the deer meat how many what's the capacity or ability like how many how many deer are we talking about that communities would ever be able to utilize if we're talking but again we don't know the population <laughs> of the deer but if we're talking about you know 11,000 deer that's a lot of seems to be a lot of deer what one of the um, was it Helen Helena? One of them had the, a bit of a breakdown on their efforts to cull mm -hmm. and how they distributed it. Yeah. Um, well, that's so what I'm curious about yeah, here. Yeah. What is the actual capacity here? Right. Like, or when you're calling up when you have deer after your hunt, or we you harvest, or other farmers harvest are harvesting yeah. deer. Are people the, are the people that are taking them? Do they always have the capacity to take them, or is it? Oh, no, because we haven't got to that point yet. Okay. But those guidelines are set out by the, by the provincial government, right? By the Ministry of Environment, and in order to harvest deer out of season, mm -hmm. you you only have two options. One is that the, that the uh, deer be uh, given to the First Nations or to a food bank. Right, so the part of the information that I so think would be useful would be to know are our soup kitchens able to take deer meat? Are are the South and other First Nations able to take a certain number of deer or you know, what would be the limits there? So yeah. that we have some some better understanding of what our what we're working with. Is that possible? Um, depending on what they're farming as well. I mean, they could put up 
they could afford to put up. And, and if I was only farming two acres, then maybe I'd put up an eight foot fence. It's amazing if, if that deer really want what's behind that fence, how they can get in there. And they can, they can get over <coughs> an eight foot fence. And, but, I mean, th there might be other circumstances as well. If that person that's got a, uh, a six-foot fence around their property also has a German shepherd barking at the, at the gates, then, you know, that's a different story as well. I mean, there could be other factors in that. <coughs> There's also a deer with antlers can break down one of those fences quite easily. Well, I have a six-foot solid fence with two German shepherds inside. Seems to work. Yeah. <laughs> but when you're not, if you're not fenced, then a do, I mean, a dog will help. Definitely, a dog will help. But I mean, when you're farming a hundred acres, you'd have to have hundred dogs. <laughs> <laughs> can, can you get insurance for crop loss for deer? Not for something like that. I mean, you can get insurance for crop loss, but normally the insurance for crop loss is extremely expensive, extremely, extremely expensive. And usually you see that, like back east, where they have, they lose their whole crop. And then the insurance will cover it. And so, Wendy, are you talking different <coughs> kinds of fencing, or are you talking generally the same kind of fencing, or are farmers doing different things with fencing, or are you... Yeah, they are doing different things. I mean, I haven't actually gone out and physically observed every one that says they have fenced and looked at what kind of fencing they have up there. But so it's possible one kind of fencing is more effective than other kinds? Yeah, 10-foot chain link fencing would be great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really, basically, that's... And, and as I said, it, it depends. There is also bylaws on height restrictions for fencing, believe yeah. it or not. <laughs> so I can't put up a 10-foot fence. Because um, there was a CTV News um, interview on October 25th, 2011, and uh, Dan, Dan's farm, mm -hmm. he said that he put up fencing and it solved his problem, but he doesn't have a problem. So those deer are actually the neighbor's so farm now. So what fencing did he put up that solved his problem? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I know that he did, he did put up some fencing. with his farm? Maybe five acres. Are there any other gaps? Or there's one I had, um, and I, there was a quick touch on it at some point there, and it was a concern for the, the loss of low-lying habitat in um, trees because they're being eaten by the deer, and they're up to eating up the area where a lot of the lower nesting songbirds live. Uh, and also the fact that they're eating the wildlife, the, 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 not the wild flowers and that, which is now clearing out a lot of our native flora and fauna, uh, flora, and it, it's starting to bring in more uh, pesky, pesky uh, bushes and shrubs and things that are non-native. There was, there was something, I can't remember, it was a little bit to do with that, but I did get an email from somebody who was very concerned. That they, the songbirds can no longer nest because the deer are eating the lower line. It's, it's 9B in your binder, Human Choices Impact Native Birds and Plants. Oh, okay. And it's by Peter Hopkins. Which one's it? 9B in your binder.
this is just an excerpt from a quite a large body of work that he's done, but he focused mostly on the Gulf Islands mm -hmm. and the understory and the rest of the area. Society does for birds. It's like an annual bird count. Would an annual deer count or one bird volunteer deer count be effective in any way? At least give us some figure. We have to done very interesting series. idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it would be yeah. a one night event. Yeah. That could happen within yeah. the next two weeks. There's obviously a lot of interest out there in this issue. Yeah. And you would get the local people who would know where the deer are mm -hmm. going to be out there. I mean, if we specify or specific <laughs> regions, I mean, you get one count in each municipality, 13 specific counts, and identify a sample area, and then we just do it. We could have a deer and bird count in one, actually. That's an interesting suggestion. Mm. Well, Machosen does a bio blitz, and they did it last weekend, and they had 60 or 70 leaders taking people out. And they uh, documented all of the animal and plant species they encountered. Right. So, but I don't know if the other communities do that. No, but I mean, the, it just—it seems to me like you could certainly get quite a few people in each region volunteering, and I'm sure the farmers would be able to go out and count the deer one night. Um, you know, in each region, and just get a, a good sense of where exactly. Well, I've had, I've actually had, there, uh, there, is, there is somebody that is tracking the deer on one of our pieces of property. Okay. And they have uh, motion video cameras. He has gone through all of the trails, all of the wooded areas surrounding this particular piece. He has marked all the trails and 
how they're getting into the property. There's, he has uh, photographed the deer as they're coming in and out. And it's changing now. The pattern is changing now because the, because the babies are being born now. So now you're starting to see more. And the crops are out of the ground. So now you're seeing more. He has calculated that there's 40 deer in that one piece of property that are coming in and out. And he's gone so far as to, you know, he's tracked, he's tracked um, deer poop everywhere and he's found their nesting areas and all that kind of stuff. That's just one area. Mm -hmm. So can it be done? Yeah, it can be done. And I'm sure that there's groups out there that, you know, the hunters, maybe even the hunters would be the ones to approach because they're the ones that know how to track them. Mm -hmm. oh, it's too bad that uh, Richard isn't here because he might have that information. Well, I guess my question would be, is that beyond the terms of reference or our capabilities to try and organize something like that in the time frame we have available? Mm -hmm. I know with my chosen, they're planning now for their blitz next year. As I understand it, we don't necessarily have to organize these things. These are things we can put in our strategies and we or don't have time to organize them. And I would suggest that we talk to the expert group, the expert committee, because um, it would be important to establish guidelines, obviously, for the council that it's very consistent in how it's done, when it's done, mm -hmm. where it's done, and that the same animals aren't getting counted over and over again, and that it is consistent with them throughout the region. Robert. Um, I guess I just need some clarification uh, on what you said, I, I take it then that if economic loss um, is accepted as, happen as happening in Sandwich, and that we don't need to worry about what that economic loss is, it's, it's been established that it exists, then really what the job of this committee is simply to say, do we do anything about it? Do we let the loss happen? Is it a, just a, a matter of, you know, it's a, it's a business loss that people have to accept? Or do we recommend that something be done about it in order to mitigate the loss? Okay, is that? Yeah, and so I think that um, what, we can, what we can commit to doing is to uh, take back to the expert resource working group and have a more fulsome discussion on the need for a count uh, to either be done now, which I tend to agree with Bob, is you know, within the time frame that this, this uh, group has to report out to the board, would be you know, highly ambitious to organize a <laughs> network of volunteers. It, it's a good mm -hmm. idea, but I just oh, I know it's ambitious. A, wow. Um, and, uh, you know, so, or whether the count should be part of the strategy, right? Uh, investigate the notion of interim uh, recommendations. Uh, mm -hmm. Patrick uh, noted uh, issue-based recommendations. So we know we've got a, an issue with agriculture. We, we have an issue with safety. We have an issue with um, gardens and then the types of options that could be considered subject to uh, X, Y, and Z. I, detailed count, you know, getting a better understanding, consultation with First Nations, understanding the capacity of, of, of receivers, uh, you know, where where uh, the option of, of control might be considered, you know. So there's, there's ways of, I think, formulating a strategy based on the information that you have and understanding the information that you don't have so that we advance the discussion at least through your set of recommendations. Do you see where I'm getting at? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you, Mark. So item five, response to May 9th, uh, 2012 request. <coughs> Jeff, please. Well, we've discussed quite a lot of this so far. I think most people have had a chance to review Wendy's submission to, uh, to 
our February board meeting um, in terms of the economic crop losses for for the farms on the Sands Peninsula. Um, I would put uh, put some of this to the expert resources working group, and and for the most part, they they came back what was what was publicly available uh, for the. The UVic rabbit management strategy, you have a backgrounder, so effectively it goes over the chronology of what has occurred and, and their timelines and, and the resulting outcome and some of the, the, the ups and downs that they experienced in terms of attempting a relocation and then uh, attempting education and bylaws and, and failing that. Um, they ended up actually euthanizing quite a number of them and they ended up moving uh, a large number of them. So there's the backgrounder there and also included with that is the Feral Rapid Management Plan which was revised and released in January 2011. Uh, so I sent you that, I believe it was earlier, late last week or, or early this week and it just goes into a little bit more detail than, than the backgrounder did in terms of chronologically laying out what the issues were and then the, the timeline that they went through. Um, and the, I see the electronic copy of this, so it, it is available online. Uh, moving on to the map, we produced the number of new dwelling units within the Capital Regional District by municipality for each census here. So that was 2001, 2006, and 2011. And paired with that is the chart, uh, should be behind it, if everyone's package was arranged in the same way. And so effectively what that shows is significant growth in Victoria, Saanich, and, uh, and, and Langford, quite, quite a long ways behind. Uh, over that 10 year period, if you were to look at it over compressed timelines, you, you might see different results, you know, between 2006 and 2000. 2011 or 2001 and 2006, but over this the last three time period, three census periods, these are the results that uh, that we were able to dig up. Yeah, is it possible to get this as a table? I can just show the table. Yes. 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 And as well with the total, like what, what's the overall growth? Uh, it's, I, I know the numbers are in here, but it's way too hard for me to right. pull them out. Must have been a spreadsheet at some point. I, the numbers were actually pulled from one of the fact sheets that we already produced within CRD Regional Planning. Um, it's on the website, and uh, we'll, 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 we'll link we'll 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 to it. Okay. Okay. So that's that's where the actual raw numbers behind those are. And finally, there was a request last week for all the community submissions and how we categorize those. Uh, there was a request for the section on recommendations. So the recommendations have been taken out of our, our overall um, categorization and, and are, have been printed and, and are available for you. Uh, and so you can see when they were sent, uh, the organization and location of where they were sent from. And uh, there's, there are, I think, about uh, six, or, six or eight pages of have a look at. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thing. Along with these um, sheets from the farmers, there was also a whole bunch of petitions that were signed. Yeah, there were many, many signatures on that petition. And it was a petition that we had at the um, uh, Sandwich Fair, and it was at the PAX booth at the Saanich Fair, and there and were a would few... Would it have been submitted in, it, in the same time? It was period? all together, yes it was, and it, and what it was, was there was, there, well there were two actually petitions, there were one that was um, farmers on the Saanich Peninsula um, requesting that we do something about the deer problem, and the other petition was for citizens, non-farmers, that support the farming community in their endeavors to do something about the deer problems. And there were a lot, I mean, there were probably almost as many as the submissions that you got through your email address. 
but they are not specific. They're just a name and a and an address. But they're also numbers. So uh, on these submissions too, there were figures, dollar figures given. So um, some of them are, yeah. Some, some of them were. Some of them were just the other day. Uh, but they're very inaccurate now because it's oh. almost a year. So these were done in August of last year, and there would be significant losses since then. Overwintering crops, particularly, because. The, the farmers that don't grow winter crops don't have deer problem, of course, because they've moved over to the farmer that does have winter crops. I have a, I have a question in the submissions. There was a, several that say use spray back. Is that spray vaccine? And is that the same as in other materials? It was saying that there wasn't, that wasn't, there was something that's not approved in Canada. There's certain medications. So Sprayback is a is a spayback. Spayback. Yeah. Is a, is a form of, of immunocompia yeah, that the we were didn't spell check because we're taking it verbatim from what people wrote in. They all they all say spray. Okay. I spray think back. that's my typo, we should say spayback. Sorry. Spay <laughs> spay 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 so it is in it is an yeah. immunocontraceptive that's okay. that, that's sprayed. Oh and uh, and it has been used experimentally on a few of the islands in BC. Uh, it is uh, one, one of the, the caveats, I suppose, that's on their website is that it's most effective in small localized populations. But then it was saying in the Hess report, I think it was, that those that those vaccines or medications that aren't approved in Canada. That's right. It's, it is, is that experimental. One of those? It, 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 that would be considered one of those. So you spray it on the Crops? Is that what you do? I, I'm not entirely about? sure of the application. <laughs> it's injected, actually. Yeah, it's injected into the animal. Oh, okay. The name's a bit of a... And it's... It's, um... Local. It's not you. Yes, yeah, so we're busy. No, but you're not the person locally. Please don't. Sorry. The He's the expert on Spayback. Right. But he can't That's what I figured. So, Bayback, I'm getting muddled with spray back. That's oh, my typo, no. I apologize, I'm correct. I got my head in the wrong space there, okay. Good, thanks. Any, any further things uh, there, Jeff? That's, that's all the requests I had for last week. So, next step. Sorry. Can I just follow up on the yeah. I, I'm interested in knowing more about it. Mm -hmm. um, Revised um, table of contents had a highlighted thing on it. Immunity. Facility control of beer is part of 7C, but if it, I missed it in the package, it would be good to be in there. Mm -hmm. uh, not a big deal, just for, for later, but it's the same topic. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so next step outline the regional deer management strategy table of contents. So Jeff, would you like to... So uh, the purpose of this section is, to, for the most part, to get an idea from you all after you've read through all this material and you've read through a number of the examples of other strategies. And this is by no means a, a firm exercise, but it's to get a start and a rough outline of what you would like to see in terms of sectioning out the, uh, the regional deer management strategy. And uh, we were going to try to to do it on the fly with the screen behind us and just um, start out with you know and, you know what would go into it in terms of executive summary and, and introductions and that type of thing. So uh, if you'd like to just start putting some ideas out there, we'll get the TV on and, and start to capture them, some of your thoughts in terms of what you foresee as being the, the pertinent topics for, for the capital region. So um, before we do, one of the terms of reference mentioned, the uh, 
agricultural priorities. Do you want us to focus on that in particular? Or you could choose to do that, yeah. yeah? Okay. So um, you're, you're all familiar with what I'm talking about? Okay. So so this is, is uh, just sort of a, a brainstorm of things that you would like to you feel or in. You know, could be could be possibilities of things that we could put in the strategies. What what strategies do you think? We're not working on an action plan at this point. We're just worrying about things we have to address, and then we can prioritize the the ones. Maybe get some kind of a consensus on how we go about this. There's a few things you know you can almost use the terms of references as a bit of a guide in terms of a, you know, background information and, and geo geographic scoping and purpose and, and things of that nature. If, uh, if you're looking for some way to, to get started. Anyone like to but start? I'm just a little confused about this. It's just. Um, are we just listing? I, I mean, it seems to me that all of these things should be on the table in some, in some way, shape, or form. So I don't want to just list everything else that's already been mentioned or as far as strategies go. It, but maybe we should be looking at what, what, just naming all those strategies and, and what are the questions that we, I don't know, what's the information we need to it, be able to evaluate the, it. The purpose is to largely know. start to frame out the format. So what sections okay. do you think would be most effective and pertinent for this particular agency you may have looked at other regions and other agencies. Fair. Yeah, and what I'm seeing over and over again in the different cities are um, management falls into the four categories. So mm -hmm. conflict reduction, population reduction, fertility control, and administrative options. Is that mm -hmm. where we should perhaps be? Is, is that, are we agree because that's exactly what I've got written yeah. here. Well, that's is what that I mean, it's already yes. listed, right? Yes. So, so, okay. so where are we going to be, agree? how do we go beyond this, that it seems it's well, already listed there quite clear. Mm -hmm. Mark, yeah. yeah, so just some thoughts on that that you might want to consider. Um, you know, I agree with you that that's listed, but do you, do you want to see, um, based on what I've heard so far this evening, interested in as local of, of a description of the, of the issues as possible with the available information that we can glean from uh, the information that we have, the farm-related information, the issues that have been raised in the emails, and to provide uh, as much of a description uh, as we can. And then there's also concern about information and data gaps. Uh, do you want to see something in the strategy that talks, speaks to those data gaps? Uh, there's concern raised regarding consultations. Uh, do you want to see a section in there that speaks to consultations? So just thinking um, no, not so much around the four management options, but let's at the moment think about setting the stage because there's a lot of concern about the kind of the, yes, we've got lots of high level information, but there's some worries about customizing it to the local area. and. Uh, want to start, if you're leading up to interim recommendations, that I agree, you'd have to provide some justification for why they're interim, or if you're leading up to making recommendations on getting more local information, you might want to start describing where your information gaps are. So those are the kinds of things that you might have to find. Okay. Well, should we, I mean, should we start with rural urban split? Really have a, yeah. There are two different types of situations, and um, rural is, I guess, north, central, and Sandwich. And I, I don't know what Machosa. Um, what What are the other rural areas? West Shore. West. West Shore. West Shore. Okay. But they're not so much agricultural like the sandwiches, the sandwich peninsulas. Okay, so why don't we have there's another category then? Mm -hmm. There's agriculture. Mm -hmm. uh, West Shore. Mm -hmm. 
not. Chosen is. Yeah, Chosen. <laughs> so is Sandwich. Ask Mr. Gowie. Maybe different kind of. If, if Sandwich is any different than Central Sandwich. Maybe we shouldn't call it rural, should we call it agricultural? Probably agricultural. Agricultural versus urban. Yeah. As an urban farmer. <laughs> Growing produce all over the city. I don't want that divide to be taken too <laughs> too drastically. Right. Um, so would you not classify yourself as an agriculturalist? Oh yeah. yeah. Agriculture. For sure. Yeah. yeah. But, but if we're saying agriculture versus urban, that's that's just not <coughs> what, what's being what are we trying to split? You have to split. The and looking urban. at the two <laughs> problems, whether you, if you're making your living out as a an agrarian or that's the that's the distinction. Right. <coughs> What's the nature of the problem? Is it affecting your livelihood, or is it affecting your aesthetics, for lack of a better way to put it? I think that's the legitimate distinction, not urban or rural. And then when we look at livelihood, we have to look at how many people in the city are living on the produce they're growing in their own <coughs> yards. Well, yeah, there are a number of those so areas, yeah, yeah. But it seems to me that's... But there's also a difference in how you can deal with the situation as well in a, yeah. in a rural area and an urban area. Yes, I, I agree with yeah. that entirely. So, it's, so one of the things that came up is the deer in the rural areas, it seems that come out more at night, whereas in the city I see them in the day all the time. So that's a, there's a distinction there that could be useful. Well, and, and how it can be handled too. I mean, you, mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't hunt or harvest deer mm -hmm. in the city, mm -hmm. period. Yeah. So, yeah, you just can't do it. Yeah. The laws won't yeah. allow you to do it. Mm -hmm. But in the rural areas, you can. Yeah. Right. So, so that's where the different way to yes. And there's different ways. Yeah. Well, maybe it's not that easy to just draw a line and say there are two cases. But we could have these divisions, and it doesn't mean. I think if we can, if we can say, okay, there's there in some cases an, an agricultural versus uh, non-agricultural division makes sense when you're looking at um, certain things like like if we're looking at uh, some of the recommendations about different plantings, you can't tell a farmer not to plant things that deers don't like, but you can tell someone, yeah. you know, if they're planting aesthetic for aesthetic purposes, you can you can make those recommendations. Um, but you can't say all urban people need to do that because a lot of times they need to li live on food as well. But then, or then if we're looking at urban rural, then there's there's a certain times when that's appropriate, like bylaws around hunting, like um, you know the 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 behavior of, of the deer. So maybe maybe the main heading is agricultural, and under that you've got some headings uh, agricultural rural, agricultural urban. Right. And they both have go to livelihood. referring to ecological parks, but that's important too. I, yeah. I mean, because mm. the, the cities deal more with those kind of mm -hmm. called urban parks. Right, but even Beacon Hill Park, like if, if the yeah. wildflowers are suffering because yeah. of that, yeah. you know, Beacon well, Hill I Park mean, is our biggest population. Mm. Then that's 
Bouchard Gardens and Royal Roads University Gardens and not those kind of places, but mm -hmm. they're hugely invested in keeping the flowers looking good. I don't know how city is. I'm sure, I'm sure Bouchard's kind of fencing. <laughs> I guess Lyme disease because we basically said that there is nothing else. And that's the only concern and we don't quite know what that concern is, but we know it's a concern. Jeff, do you have any documentation of um, conflict between deer and bicyclists? particularly on the Lockside Trail? Not, not specifically. There's likely a little bit in the, uh, the submissions that we received to date. Otherwise, it's just anecdotal information that we have right now. We haven't specifically requested it.
nobody really thinks to report them for any particular reason unless there's uh, a significant amount of, of damage to mm -hmm. property or, or health. Because it, it is a concern. I mean, believe it or not, I mean, it's something that we people, I don't know if you've ever ridden your bike down the, lo uh, the Lockside Trail up to the peninsula, there's deer on there. And they have been reported to charge when they have fawns. I guess what we're trying to do here is identify what it is we're trying to address, the issues that we're trying to address, what we have to work with, the missing parts, and then, in my mind anyways, then, then, then that sets the scene for any solutions that you might recommend. So now, we should be going back to these and, and sort of listing all the things that we feel about them. Is that what you're suggesting? Well, um, keep in mind that you've got us as a, as a resource, mm -hmm. and what we can do, if this is, and again, I'm trying to 
kind of we do. Uh, but uh, if this is what you're interested in, we can take the available information and start to um, flesh this out a bit in terms of describing what the local situation is, and that, uh, and then make sure that we've got it you know, in keeping with your expectations, and then we start to um, look at things like. Uh, what kind of criteria would we use to evaluate any potential solution before we actually get into the solutions of the, you know, which are laid out in the four groups there, mm -hmm. right? So this helps you, what we're trying to do is help you kind of scope the issues, yeah. understand the information that you have and that you don't have, uh, and then how you would go about evaluating what would be a recommendation that you could make before you actually get into that sort of heavy lifting of, of making the recommendations so that there's some you know, kind of a stepwise progression how you would get from, from where we are now with all of this material uh, in front of you to how you might make a, a recommendation. Well, the next point is urban, isn't it? We've got the agricultural. I mean, there might be more things you want to put in there. Yeah. But the next subheading or the next big heading is open. And that the issues there may be different. Um, yeah. Um, so safety may be a bigger issue in an urban setting than agriculture. I, I don't know. Aesthetics may be more important. Uh, health issues may be more important because the population is much more dense. The urban should be big, right? It's a big. is one and urban is two. What's something like A or B? Well, like all those other ones yeah. pertain specifically to agriculture. <laughs> no, it's agricultural areas, I guess. Right. But you have the same, you have the same types of issues around safety and health. Yeah. Yes, then yeah. it's it, the, the nature is different. Well, that's what I mean. It just, I didn't think that we were going through a whole list specifically under agriculture. Yeah. I thought that was everything. So we're saying here that we do need to take different approaches to different areas. That no, no area is exactly the same. So now our next step then is to figure out biggest concerns, give them some kind of priority, which ones the, the, the concerns we think are the, the ones that need to be addressed. Well, we've been given our way. marching orders on that. The priority is at the agricultural, right? I mean, that's our mandate. Let's do that one first. G 
geographic dimension, right? So whether it's urban or rural. And then on actually on page uh, five of the um, terms of reference for the regional deer management strategy, which is apparently in tab five of your binders now after a green uh, cover. evaluation criteria that you might consider uh, your management options against uh, and uh, you know that's where I think we need to kind of uh, get you brainstorming on whether you know whether it's this list captures it or whether there are other considerations uh, that we should try to somehow define an evaluation matrix for you to be able to look at those four groups of management options against to come up with any recommendation in, in future. So this tells us that you know we're going to try and describe the problem in those terms with as local of information as we have. And then we're going to have a section in the thing that's going to talk about information gaps. A lot of that will be around numbers, uh, that we don't have local counts and we don't have complete um, economic loss information. And then, uh, so after that, I think we need to look at what kinds of criteria should we be assessing these management options against. This is, yeah, okay. So everybody has the right page here? Does it matter? <laughs> okay, so the first criteria mentioned here is public acceptability. Having looking at these things that we, that we have up here on the board. And feel free to discuss. Yeah, it's my view that we will then assess various management options against yeah. this criteria. Yeah, so we, we suggested some in here, mm -hmm. we're not married to them. They're just no, little bit of straw dogs. My question is how will we be able to judge public acceptability? You may recommend to the board of directors that uh, the criteria, if they're not going to do the poll until after, may be X, Y, and Z. Your interim recommendations might be based on different criteria like availability of information or securing better information. So these may not be appropriate for, for you to evaluate, although some of them might be. I mean, you, you might be able to get a handle on cost, not necessarily in dollar figures, but in high, medium, low cost, right? Uh, you might be able to, uh, by the time you get there, get a sense of implementation considerations. So are there bylaws, if we you know, do a better job of uh, canvassing the bylaws, are there bylaws that get in the way of any of your management options? So it's a matter of how you think you uh, want to make your recommendation based on some sort of kind of systematic evaluation of different criteria. Now, I'm hearing earlier on the conversation that a big concern is not knowing the numbers and the geographic distribution of those numbers. Another one is, uh, you know, so, so that might weigh heavily into how you make your recommendations uh, to, to the board, right? So good data, poor data. Yeah. And, uh, and, and it may also then affect the types of recommendations So it's really, rather than get into the, you know, jumping straight into the management options, it's kind of framing out how you're going to think about it and how you would make your recommendations uh, to the board. So under evaluation criteria, can we put some um, a lack of data or data that we think we require in order to evaluate anything? Yeah, availability of data. Availability of data. Yeah. And I, I would put that out at, up above public acceptability. Yeah. But we'll we're not there yet. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That might be something that you eventually 
recommend to the board as one of the criteria against which they would make their final recommendations, but if you're going with an interim recommendation approach, your criteria have to be different. You know, they may also include such things as, um, you know, consultation, you know, good, medium, poor, you know. I'm not sure how that criteria availability of data will work if what we're saying right now is that we know we don't have what we like. Doesn't that just mean every option will be unable to evaluate because we lack data? It will just become a, a, a meaningless circle until we have some data. I, I think it's an information gap, and I think the lack of data goes to maybe the reliability of the evaluation um, or our ability to assess efficacy because even if we recommend a call that's going to take out X thousand, we still won't know how effective that is really to do it because we don't know what we started with. So it impacts things like that. But if we make it the most important criteria, we we'll always come back to the same conclusion. Insufficient data can make can't go anywhere with it, and it, it, it just puts us into a, in, into a loop too, too quickly. Right, so you're, you're, if you look, th think about it in the terms of laying out your evaluation criteria and coming up with categories, so availability of, of data, you know, good, fair, poor, and for certain management options, you may say that in order to do uh, immunocontraception, for example, you need good data. Well, we don't have good data, so therefore it's difficult to make that recommendation at this time. And your recommendation, therefore, is in order to consider some of these uh, specific management options, uh, you know, we recommend that you need to collect, you know, s data that's specific to uh, certain geographies that's defined by the issues. So there'll be information that you need to collect in the agricultural areas in order to support certain uh, decisions on management options. So just trying to back it up, uh, mm -hmm. back you out a little bit to, to because you've got some limitations here that we discussed earlier around knowing how many there are and where they are. And so rather than pretend that we can make um, you know, specific recommendations uh, on management options, there maybe needs to be a way of accounting for how um, how those recommendations could be made if we had better information. It's a pretty funky uh, phone. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, availability of da data belongs to an information gap. And that's what it is. Mm -hmm. It's not a, it's not an evaluative criteria. It's an information gap. Yeah, I would say so. And. Um, we might need to fill that gap before we can evaluate something. Mm -hmm. But it's not part of the criteria, I guess. It's I mean, the evaluation criteria would be um, is a cull successful in reducing the economic loss, or would it be successful in reducing the economic loss in some Well, that, I mean, you, you have to look at effectiveness depending on the, the nature of the problem you're trying to get at. What may be effective in dealing with health issues may not be so effective in dealing with economic issues. So I think it's a, it, it, we, we have certain, I guess, problems or issues that we're trying to resolve, including economics. I think one 
each one of those possibilities would have to be measured against how effective it is in terms of resolving the problem.
No. Um, so licensing and regulations as the, the implementation considerations, is yeah, that part of that? They can't even Seems to me it's a, it's a consideration somewhere in here that we have to ask who's going to who's going to do it. It's each municipality going to be responsible. But yeah. once the once the uh, I guess the CRD recommendations go out, will the municipalities then look at them and make individual choices? Great, right. and that's that's not really known yet. We do have step four is implementation in the um, terms of reference on page six, and um, the region doesn't currently have any. Resources allocated for implementation, and uh, we look at several options for implementation, including by municipalities. But we, you know, can only offer it out there as a consideration. But it, but it is a, and maybe this goes back to the geographic scope of some things. Let's say it does absolutely no good for one small area to say, okay, we're going to change what people can plan, so the deer won't want to stay here. Something I don't recall seeing in this material was any information about the Agricultural Land Commission lands in this area. Do we have that information? Do we know where they are? Yeah. Yes. Is it? I I think it would be useful to know how much land is protected in mine. I will see it. I think that will give us <coughs> a vision for the future of what the changes want to be. Those lands are not, by and large, being developed. Many of the municipalities do yes. have individual ones. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are we in need of a little fresh air, stretch your legs, or something? Maybe take a few minutes' break. And, uh, okay. I think we're all up to 10 minutes. Okay, are we ready to resume here? It shouldn't be much to look at. Okay. okay, we all seem to have been suffering a little bit from, um, I don't know, information overload or learning curve or something. Um, but one of the things that we have been tasked with is coming up with addressing agricultural uh, losses or the, the situation with the uh, um, people in agricultural uh, livelihood. And uh, so maybe one of the things that we could do is ask those people here with some of the things that we've talked about, what are, what are your opinions of, of what we've talked about? see how it could be helpful to you? Or where where would you like to take it? And maybe, you know, if you can't come up with the answers right now, that's okay. It's just something to think about. Um, and Carrie, you had something you wanted yeah, to Yeah, I just, to I'm frustrated with the lack of baseline information. And for me, that's the starting point, is, is 
what are we working with? How big is the problem? Is there a problem? What, 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 is, what are the parameters of the problem? I mean, to me, it's all just sort of this loose, at this point, anecdotal, and it's very difficult for me to make any kind of um, choices or opinions or make suggestions or form any kind of um, outline of how to deal with the problem when I don't even know what the problem is. Um, I go back again to this University of Manitoba thesis where she spent several years going through determining all those very issues and working with those baseline issues to come up with some sort of solution to the problem, but figuring out first what the problem was. And that's, for me, what's lacking in information. On what is the problem? How big is it? And going, going from there. It's very difficult for me to, to go from here with no information. And that's what we're working with. How many deer there are? Where are they? What exactly are the problems? Everything I hear is anecdotal so far. So, any suggestions? Is it possible that maybe we could all get this, read it through, put if you could send it to us on, if you said it's online, and um, maybe get a clearer idea of what you're this talking about? This is based on science and studies and surveys, and it's concrete information. That's what I feel is lacking. Well, I, let's, I mean, I think we should see what it covers. It would be really interesting. To read. I mean, we don't have years. You know, we, we've got two months. Um, but I mean, I think if there's a, a general feeling around the table that that we can't do an adequate job until we have this information, then we need to say that. I mean, otherwise we're just wasting everybody's time. Um, you know, I, I th maybe we don't need all of this information. Um, maybe we have do it with a much simplified version and maybe we can rely to some extent on anecdotal evidence I mean I don't mind doing that um, but I, I just think we're sort of waffling in the wind here and, and not really knowing where to go I mean basically what we've been doing is repeating what's already been said in the material you know, it's, well, that's not the point. The point is to come up with some solutions or ideas for the CRD. Um, maybe we can't do it. And maybe there are two ways of looking. Like you said, there's uh, there are some people who cannot move forward without the facts and just the facts and the figures and the scientific approach. There are people, though, who live with all these animals on their properties crops and that. And so, you know, maybe they're not really concerned about the numbers so much as how do we how do we fix this? How do we carry on with our life pre deer invasion? So, you know, somewhere in between the two, I yeah. think that's our our role to come up with something and we don't have very long to do it in. So, um, you know, if, if we if we have this information from the farmers and we do, we have a lot of information dollar figures, um, then and people feel that that's enough, um, then let's get down to the nitty gritty based on that evidence. You know, what, do they want to see a call? If they do, how many? How do they do it? Um, otherwise, I think we're, we're wasting time. Bob. <coughs> Jocelyn, thank you for those well-chosen words of wisdom. Uh, Sherry carries frustration as a scientist in not having the data, but I still think we have a task before us and we can move ahead with the information that we do have. It's limited as it is. Right. So, shall we move ahead or <laughs> try? Yeah, then I think so. that's, that's the issue. If we feel like that, then I'm quite happy to do that. Then we should move ahead. And, and the first spot to go is Saanich and farmers. Let's hear what they want us to do, or what, what their suggestions are. And what do they base, you know, they have to come up with a cogent argument in terms of how many deer they're concerned about, 
what is an effective way of dealing with that? Um, can they show that it's effective?
decision that they made to move ahead with this. <coughs> the, the presentation that she gave, the information that she gave. Uh, I don't know that I would describe it that way, but it, it was it, it was a it, it was a good presentation. It was very insightful and informative. So you've seen the presentation. Do you think that it would be? I I, I think more information that would be good for you guys, but it, you know it, it's up to you if you think it would be. Can you give a thumbnail sketch of what the presentation is about? But is it more information or is it just the same information? Yeah. Is it 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 what, I'm, what I'm wondering is, it can she kind of clarify or coalesce or maybe focus our thinking a little better on from hearing it from somebody? Would it inspire us to get on the same page here? Because we've got a lot of different Can she put feelings. it in a context? You know, or can she conclude, given all this information, the conclusion is that, um, or is that our job, I suppose? I, I think the, the conclusion was reached by the board that they wanted to manage the strategy <laughs> and they wanted a citizen's advisory <laughs> yeah. to yeah. do it, but not to reinvent a wheel and, and not to undertake a, a huge research project yeah. on, on deer population. And maybe at the end of the day, we could see the deer, you know, and three years ago there was, you know, maybe four or five deer would come in and out of a particular piece of property. And now you're looking at about 20 going in and out. So, it, I mean, I first have seen it multiplied. Now, if it's doing that on the properties that I'm leasing or that I own, obviously it's got to be doing it on the other property. I mean, I don't have a count. I can't. I could give you a count if I s went stay outside for a, a few nights in each one of the properties. I could give you a count. But, but, uh, and we could. <coughs> okay, Bob. Sorry. Trustman, um, if we're going to ask somebody from the expert resource working group to appear, I would very much like to hear what has worked in this area before, particularly in terms of goose management. One of the individuals on this list uh, was, took the lead on that. He is an agrologist. He's on the board of my institute. And um, Rob Klein is his name. And perhaps Rob could give us some insights into other solutions to problem wildlife issues in this area. Just an idea. OK, well, you tell me. Who would you, who would you like to see? Who, does this sound good to the rest of you? Let's see if we could get Rob. a biologist on how these, this whole problem was created. And all I keep hearing is the bad deer, and the deer did this, and the bad deer, and the deer are doing this. The deer, the, the, the deer problem is the result of humans, and human interaction, and human um, um, invasiveness on the environment, on, on habitats and ecosystems. And there's no discussion about that, and there's no consideration for that in all of this. So if we just keep going down the road the way we're doing with development and people and, and pushing out the deer and forcing out the animals, not only deer but other, it's going to be the geese next, it's going to be raccoons, it's going to be squirrels, it's going to be on and on. Um, my concern is what's causing the problem? How can we minimize the problem and what can we do learn from all this for down the road? Because our population just keeps growing and growing and growing in the CRP. So this problem is not going to go away. It's a long
long-term problem. And when I read in all of these, every one of them says we have to coexist with wildlife. And here, all I'm hearing is cull, get rid of them, get rid of them, get rid of them. And I, I have huge issues with that, ethical issues, and I don't think it's going to solve the problem. Anytime man comes in and tries to cull and wipe out the species, it just creates a whole other problem in the, in the ecosystem. So I, I, I would really like to learn from perhaps biologists coming in, explaining how this problem is all created and where it's going to go and what, what if we start making suggestions and we don't even know it from a biological and environmental point of view what it all means making these suggestions, I think they're very unwise suggestions. And I would like to see, um, have some biological perhaps advice to make so we can make informed decisions as to what might be possible solutions to this problem. But the other part of that, we don't even know what the problem is or the extent of the problem is. Yes, agriculture. But in the urban areas, we, we really don't know what the problem is or what the extent of the problem is, and that's a huge concern for me. It's all anecdotal. If we're going on anecdotal, we'll use my street. Um, there's two people on the street that have an issue with the deer. The rest of the people on the street are quite happy to coexist with the deer. So that's my anecdotal information, and that's what we're, we're going on. So, so uh, you, you bring up a good point. Thank you, Terry. And that is... Um, I do not hear that we're going ahead with coal. That is an option. We're talking options here. We've got an option status quo uh, and all in between. So I, I don't think uh, we've come to that any conclusions at all. There's a no, we have That seems to be the first word that seems to come up. Well, it may have been the first word that came up. I agree, but I don't think it's intended as solution necessarily. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we have to keep remembering that and the, that whatever we come up with is a recommendation and it's the final decision of the board to act upon it. And there may be reasons as simple as they can't afford to or so whatever, I don't know. It doesn't mean that that will be the end result. It's just something for them to use and advise. Um, somebody else had salt. Did you have something else to say? No? Um, I did, but I think it's been shaped a little. <laughs> uh, I'm just, I guess, I don't know, I'm starting to look at it like, if you want to look at it a bit more holistically, you can kind of look at it kind of like, a, like dealing with a human, human body. You've got an issue maybe with bacteria or something, and so you, you look at what are the causes, the root causes of that, but in the immediate term, you've got some symptoms that you need to be that you need to deal with. So then, how do you deal with those symptoms, the short term and long term? And so I think we can we can look at both things. We can look at the root causes, and we can also look at the symptoms that we're experiencing right now, and that's crop losses and you know and other kinds of other issues. There's so there's short term, there's long term. I, don't know, I guess that's the way I'm shaping it in my mind. I don't think they're I I agree. We can't. You know, just go and wipe out an entire species in the city. It's never going to work. It never has. Um, hasn't worked on Sydney Island, it sounds like. I'm not sure. But you could potentially manage it. Maybe we need to start looking them, looking at them as not just pests, but also food source. Um, or, you know, for, for their hides, look at it in a more holistic uh, way. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's one of the... For me, one of the things that I, I kept hearing is, wait a minute, okay, we, we've got this <laughs> this animal, we're looking at it as a pest, but no, it's actually a really good food source for the entire region. That could get us off, you know, bringing in animals being trucked in on highways from factory farms in the southern United States. <laughs> we can start to, to look at things in a big... We, we, we can go a long ways with that if we want to start rethinking how how we're looking at it, um, but we have some immediate symptoms that we need to deal with, and that's the urgency. It's just an, an old, age-old situation we're looking at here, and it's sort of not unlike the current thing the governments are uh, governments going up through with, with the lumber. You know, it should we be exporting and chopping down trees to give these guys jobs? 
here we're talking shit. How do we get rid of these deer so these people, agricultural people, can live and carry on with their agriculture? It's just the old conflict. People have to live, but we don't want necessarily to... Somebody's got to be a victim. Is that, is that or do they? Well, and yeah. we need to eat. <laughs> we all need yeah. to eat. Whatever we're eating, it, it's coming from somewhere where somebody is managing pests. <laughs> So if we're eating food that's coming from, you know, a local farm, they're having to deal with the deer issue. If we're bringing, you know, vegetables in from across the country, they're also dealing with that same issue. So it's not just about the farmers, it's about our, our food, our sustenance. And, and if we can start to think of it that way, it's, it's not an us or them, or we're all, we're, we're, we're talking about managing our food source. And, I, and you may, and, uh, we're not talking about, the farmers are not talking about going out there and getting rid of every deer on the Saanich Peninsula. That was never been our intent. Mm -hmm. What we are asking and what we asked for when we went to the original CRD meeting was that we need to make it manageable. And I, I agree with Wendy, and that's what all these reports say, management is crucial. What I have trouble with is we don't even know what it is that needs to be managed. It's this loose unknown out there. So how can you manage the problem when you're not really sure what it is? And I absolutely agree the agricultural problem is very different from the urban problem as well. And they are two very separate things. But they both need to be managed. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and probably very different things. But again, for both of them, Excuse me. It's really difficult when you have no concrete idea of what the problem is. It's very, it's very difficult to deal with. I'm wondering if we can, is there anyone that could give us some recommendations on, or some a, a better detailed details on, say, uh, if if the deer population is this then X would work. If the deer population is Y, would this work? And then we can say, if the deer population is X, then we recommend this. And if the deer population is Y, we recommend that this be used. Um, and, and, uh, and that way, we're setting ourselves up for a, a series of recommendations that are based on the information that we're going to get, hopefully, <laughs> when we do that volunteer deer count. <laughs> Uh, you know, 20, 20 weeks away or something, then at least we have a series of recommendations that are set up based on that. So I, I, then that way we can get away from, ah, we can't do anything because we don't have the numbers. We can just say, we okay, this is, yeah, yeah this is what we will do if this is, or what we want to do if and, this is the case. And part of the recommendation is that each area has to do its own deer identification. Yeah. So then you're, if yeah. Then, you know, well, and you apply it to each area. So the symptom yeah. in the agricultural areas is this, and you know, if there's this many deer, this will this many deer, this will work. So if there's five deer on a property on a regular basis, then the five deer limit would work fine. But if the if if there's eighty deer, it's not going to do anything. So uh, yeah. Is this an approach that gets species planning, um, species at risk planning, just called adaptive management, which is a kind of nice catch term that basically says try something, evaluate it, if it didn't work, do something else, if it didn't work, do more of it. I mean, that's simplistic, but the, 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 it's really not much more than that. You can make it very, very complex or very, very simple. Well, and, and but that's kind of, it's not quite the same thing that we're talking about, but it seems to me it's one way that you deal with insufficient information to, to make firm conclusions as you make hypotheses, try it with some thoughts about it. if this doesn't work, then we'll do this. And there was a very good suggestion, Bob, in the meeting that was Helen Helena again. And sorry, we don't we don't have a meeting. Um, and that was that they tried catching I think it was mule deer with the target. They were the problem deer, and they had the white-tailed mm -hmm. deer. And it turned out they used these nets, I can't remember what, clover, clover traps. And they ended up getting 
more white tails when their target group was a mule. So then they had to rethink it. And I'm sure that could, you know, that could happen. The same idea as you're suggesting. You need sort of a plan B if something's that dry. Okay, so coming back to, we're getting to a quarter to nine here. Um, what would you like seen for next week? Would you like to see if Jeff can get us a biologist? Uh, what, sorry, your mm. Rob, so, well, he's an agrologist with uh, the Ministry of Agriculture. Okay. So, does that sound like a, <coughs> it might be helpful to people? Yeah, with specific, obvious knowledge of the issue. Mm -hmm. and maybe we can ask them to, you know, we're not looking for specific numbers. We're looking for assumptions. What, what would the number be where he would think that um, this would be the appropriate approach? So, um, you know, how does that change depending on what the numbers are, or does it change? Mm -hmm. um, so that we're, we're not operating on real facts, but we are operating on experts making assumptions about what they would do if these were the numbers. Okay. So if, if we uh, can get a speaker in next week, we can try and focus on that topic. But questions around population counts or uh, density uh, estimates back to them for their uh, the experts for their consideration. Um, and like Jeff said earlier, we might have to fiddle around with the uh, meeting dates in order to accommodate um, different schedules. So we will be in touch with you on that. contact information from everybody. Yeah. Oh, yeah. right, yeah. yes. So does anyone have a problem with, with that? Nobody has a problem. No? Yeah. Within it, maybe no. Just within the within group. group. Okay. So there being no further business,